Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. God, I'm glad to be here, and I'm I'm glad to be sober. Uh, I'm glad to be in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to uh, thank my friend Frederick for uh, extending the privilege of participating in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's uh, my opinion, and I hope it always remains such, that it's some type of a privilege to be allowed to come and sit with you good people. I hope I don't ever get it through my sick head that I have a right to everything that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just because I was lucky enough to stumble into a room and get sober and stay that way. I'm here to tell you that everything that's good and decent in my life today is a direct result of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. So my life today is a very good one. And it due probably to the actions that I've taken in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, even though I didn't even believe in them most of the time. I still don't believe in them most of the time, (laughs) but I still do them because I haven't got a better idea. I'm extremely pleased to be here today, fully clothed and in my right mind. And the reason I tell you that is... uh, The longer I stay sober, the more necessary it becomes for me to remember from whence I came. And I never want to forget that a little over 46 years ago today, I came to in a cell in solitary confinement in a maximum security penitentiary drifting in and out of total insanity. Now, because of a loving God has expressed himself through our program called Alcoholics Anonymous, it's no longer necessary for me to crawl around on my hands and eat like an animal. If I don't get nothing else out of this deal at all, I guess I can live with that for a long time. It makes me feel good. Now, I'd like to be able to stand here and tell you, without any kind of God whatsoever, that that's where alcohol and drugs took me to. Oh, God, I'd love to be able to tell you that. That's where I took me to. The only thing that alcohol and drugs ever did in my life, it kept me alive long enough to stumble into a room of alcoholics and on. That's it. If I hadn't taken a drink of alcohol, I'd have blown my brains out before I was nine years old. I'm a misfit. I've always been a misfit. I've never seemed to belong where I was at. I was always a little restless, irritable, and discontented. I had a little streak of anger and violence inside of me that I couldn't quite comprehend. I didn't understand then, as I've come to understand now, that those are the symptoms of the most deadly disease that's ever been known to mankind. My sponsor tells me, and I have no reason to doubt him, that there's written history on the disease of alcoholism that stretches back almost 7,000 years. That's amazing to me. I didn't understand that then, and I don't understand that now. I knew a lot about whiskey growing up. Everybody in my family drank whiskey. They made it. They sold it, and they drank it. That's what they did in that order. They were Irish. They had no religion to hold their guilt down, so they just went crazy, them people. I mean, they were crazy people. My uncle drank whiskey and went to penitentiary. My aunt drank whiskey and worked in a poorhouse on the other side of the track. My mother got drunk and beat up my dad. My dad got drunk and beat up my mother. Every once in a while, they both got drunk and beat me up. That's what I said. My reaction to that was, I'm not going to drink. Look what it does to these people. And so I started looking for a way out of this dilemma a long time before I ever got to alcoholics. I believe, personally, that my entire lifetime was spent on some type of a a longing search for something that I seemed to have been born without. I was born with this constant need to find something. I didn't know what it was because I didn't know what was wrong with me. But I knew there was something missing in my life, and I had to find it. Now, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about it. See, it's kind of hard to seek the answer to a problem if you don't know what it is. 
And I don't know what's wrong with me. I haven't got a clue what's wrong with me. I looked up one day, saw my grandmother. My grandmother lived till she was 90 years old. She never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in her life. My grandmother wouldn't think it's a big deal that I've been sober almost 45 years. Big deal, she'd say. I ain't had a drink for 90. <laughs> Looked at her and said, you should have had a couple granny make you feel better from time to time. My grandmother got up every day of her life and went somewhere. I didn't know where she went for a long time. And when she came back, something happened to her. She'd get up on Sunday morning because my uncles and my grandfather used her house for a war zone on Saturday. They'd drink each other's whiskey and steal each other's women. They had a hell of a time, I suppose. I guess whoever survived was the king for the week. I don't know how they worked out their structure. But Grandma used to get up on Sunday morning and step across these people with the best dress she had. She'd be gone for a couple hours. And when she came back, something happened to her. I could see it as clear as I can see you. She danced around these people and cleaned them up and cooked for them and sang songs to Jesus. Now, I took a look at that and filed that in my keen alcoholic mind. Now, for you who are new at Alcoholics Anonymous today, this is the only place in the world you're ever going to hear about the keen alcoholic mind. You're never going to go to an Al-Anon meeting and hear about the keen alcoholic mind. They don't say things like that. They say things like, the keen alcoholic got up last night and peed in the linen closet. But they don't tell you how smart we are. But I had some kind of an idea, because I don't know what's wrong with me. But all I'm going to have to do is go where my grandmother goes and do what my grandmother does. I'd be like my grandmother. But I've come to understand I'm not like my grandmother. You see, my grandmother's not alcoholic. She just isn't alcoholic. And you couldn't make her one. My grandmother got everything she needed out of life out of the church that she went to. And so not knowing what was wrong with me and thinking all I got to do is go where grandma goes and do what grandma does, I'd be like grandma. I put my little hand in my grandmother's hand and went over and sat in my grandmother's church with her when I was a child. And I don't know what I expected, but I don't remember anything drastically happening to me. And what I've come to understand, because I've been sober a long time, is that there was nothing in the world wrong with my grandmother's church. There was something wrong with the jackass sitting in it. That's what was wrong with it. Me. I'm doing in that church what I did all my life prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and for a long time after I'm here. I'm looking for something way out here to make me feel better in here. I didn't understand that. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking for something out here to make me feel better here, which only proves to me that the problem has always been there. Now, what happened to me is that I sat on the back porch of my grandfather's house one day watching my grandfather drink whiskey out of a fruit jar. And my grandfather left, put it down, and I picked it up and took a drink of it. That's all I did. I just took a drink. The next couple of minutes of my life is what makes me an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic because I spent the next 20 years of my life creating mayhem out there in the world. I'm an alcoholic because I have some type of an abnormal reaction to alcohol. Now, it's really not a bad reaction. If it had been a bad reaction, I'd have never drank it again. It's a good reaction to the alcohol. (laughs) That stuff went down inside of me and kind of stilled the madness that was going on in there, kind of calmed things down. And more important than anything else, it reached up into my head and hit that switch up there that says, I don't care. I really don't care what's going on around here. And that's it. But that's not the thing that drove me into the gates of insanity and death. What got me is what happens to alcoholics of my type once I put alcohol into my system. You see, once I put alcohol into my system, then and only then am I drinking to overcome a craving that's beyond all human understanding and beyond all human help. I didn't know that. Because what happened to me when I took a drink is what the old Chinese philosopher said a long time ago. I took a drink, the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me. Because my pattern for living, from that moment on until I got to you good people, almost 20 years later was the same 
I took a drink of alcohol, and three days later I was pulled out from underneath the bridge, stood in front of a judge, and sent to the Hutchison State Reform School. Twenty years later, I took a drink of alcohol. They pulled me out of a car in Compton, stood me in front of a judge, and sent me to 20 years in the penitentiary. Now, that's what happened to me when I drank. I got drunk and went places. I just traveled around out there. I went from reform school to reform school, to junior penitentiaries, to penitentiaries, to nut houses. Now they call them treatment centers. <laughs> I'm a little more partial to nut house. It's a little more macho. <laughs> oh, come on. If you want to be bad, you ought to be bad. I mean, don't quit drinking because you puke a little. Hang in there. Give it everything you got. Alcoholics Anonymous works a hell of a lot better when you run out of options. I gave it everything I had out there. I threw everything into the battle and didn't have an idea what was kicking my tail. I did not know what was doing it. Because I walked out of institutions from the time I was that high until I was 30 years old. On a periodic basis. As physically sober as I am this moment. As physically sober. And not one time did I ever say to myself, Self, do you realize how long it's been since you've had a series of those electroshock treatments? Why don't you have a drink? Why don't you have a drink and go out there and kill your baby brother? Why don't you have a drink of alcohol and go out there and tear your mother's heart out one more time? Why don't you have a drink of alcohol and go out and run those streets, join them gangs, do what you do out there, tear people up, rip them alive? Why don't you go out there and do that? Why don't you go out there and get shot and stabbed a couple more times? Just have a drink, no? I never took a drink in my in my life to get drunk. I never took a drink to go on a party. I never took a drink for any other reason other than the fact why alcoholics of my type take a drink after being sober for a period of time. It's just to go. But you see, that's all it takes. Because once I put alcohol in there, I'm powerless not to take the next one. And if I don't find some way to live, and if you're an alcoholic of my type and you don't either, if I don't find some way to live where I don't have to seek that instant relief that comes with taking a few drinks, I'm going to have to drink again because I'm an alcoholic. I have no more choice about that than I do about flying around this room. I just don't understand that. I'm sitting on a furrow from a reform school. I'm 10 or 11 years old. I'm drinking a bottle of Marco Petri red wine. Most of you probably never heard of Marco Petri red wine. And the reason you never heard of it is because it was experimental stages of Thunderbird, which is as cheap as it gets in the United States. I started out on cheap wine and worked down. That ain't easy. I'll tell you how bad that stuff was. It never saw a grape. But it gets you. <laughs> and I'm drinking this stuff, and I'm sitting on the street corner with my little gang, and we're acting like gangsters and playing like gangsters and behaving like little gangsters and practicing to be professional convicts, I suppose. I don't know, but we're doing it. And a guy tapped me on the shoulder and said, why don't you try these? And he gave me some pills. Now, I don't remember saying to him, what are those? Will they bother me if I take them? I just took them. Thank God they weren't X-Lax. That's all I can tell you. There's no telling what I'm going to do in some of these meetings. All I can tell you about that is, it was like lighting up an afterburner on a rocket ship. Because that launched me into another dimension of hell that I didn't even know existed. And it kept driving me down there deeper and deeper and deeper. A couple of years later, I'm sitting on that same street corner on a furlough from another reform school. And I'm eating these pills, and I'm drinking this wine. I might have been smoking a little non-habit form of marijuana, for all I know. <coughs> and a guy stuck a needle in my arm. And for the next 14 years of my life, I stuck needles in my arm, ran in and out of the institution. That's what I do. See, I live out there in the streets, and I do what people like me who live in the streets do. I destroy everything that comes in contact with me. I'm like a plague. There's a reason for that, you know. I'm selfish, and I'm self-centered, and I'm self-serving. I have an ego bigger than this entire room. I'm a taker of things, and I'm a user of people, so therefore I'm a loser. I don't understand any of that kind of stuff, but I can tell you at the ripe old age of 25 or 26 years old, whenever it was, 
I came to in a cell in solitary confinement in maximum security penitentiary. And what's significant about that to me today is there wasn't a single solitary soul left upon the face of this earth that would send me a penny postcard. They were all gone. But you know what? They should be gone. And I don't have any right to have any of it back just because I'm so good. Everything that's good and decent in my life is some type of an unearned gift that has been given to me from this God I discovered sitting with you. I don't understand that, but that's what's stumbling in your meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't come here to get sober. I was physically sober when I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on the fourth day of November 1959, as I am this moment. It's physically sober. I didn't come here at all to get sober. If I'd have known why I was coming, I wouldn't have come. I'm not alcoholic. Nobody ever called me an alcoholic. I've been called a lot of things, but alcoholic wasn't one of them. And if you had to call me an alcoholic, I'd have hit you. Because I'm a gangster of some sort, so I think. I'm a lot of bad things, you know what I mean? But I'm not an alcoholic. I don't even know what one was. Nobody even mentioned it to me. The reason I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous was because the institution I was in let women come in there. I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous almost 45 years ago to smell perfume. <laughs> I did. And I've been honking and sniffing around her ever since. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference why you come. I, I remember sitting, moving in and sitting down in the back row. I lovingly like to call that my throne of contempt. I had my coat collar up and my shades on because I was cool. If I'd have been any cooler when I got here, I'd have probably froze to death, for God's sake. <laughs> but there I said, for all intents and purposes, a dead man. And what is really frightening to me sometimes today is, here I am sitting in a room. I'm staring at an answer that I had sold my soul for. I don't recognize the answer because I don't know what the problem is. Over and over and over. If you'd have put a lie detector test on my arm that day and said, are you alcoholic? I'd have said, no, I'm not. The needle wouldn't have moved. So you can't be something if you don't know what something is. Now, just waving your hand and saying you're one doesn't mean that you are one. I didn't know. So I thought, well, I sit around and wait for these women to get up and tell their racy stories. Now, when I got here, there weren't very many young, pretty girls like Barbara hanging around alcoholics, no. <laughs> if they were, they weren't sending them up that penitentiary where I was at, I'll tell you that. These old gals got up to talk, and one of them said she'd drank for a long time. You could look at her and know she'd been somewhere for a long time. <laughs> she said, I used to drink. I said, I'll bet you did. <laughs> Bad stuff. But see, I knew everything when I came to alcoholics. I'm a walking encyclopedia of useless information. <laughs> I know so much about what ain't true, I don't know what is true. So there, in all intents and purposes, there I said a dead man. <coughs> and I don't know what's going on. Staring at this answer. I'm fascinated by these people. I can't understand what they're doing. These people get up on Sunday morning. Now, Sunday morning now, you understand? Sunday morning. They leave their family. They get in their old cars. They buy their own gasoline. They drive a hundred miles up those old back roads and they spend two hours talk to a room full of people who don't want to listen to them. <laughs> people like me who sit in the back road and made fun of them. It took me a long, long time to realize how sick that was. <laughs> Here I am sitting in the penitentiary. I don't know when I'm going home. And I'm making fun of people who are leaving in an hour. <laughs> Something wrong. I don't know what's going on. But I do know one thing. These people fascinate me. I can't figure them out. I can't understand what they're doing. Why would they do that? There was something about them that attracted me to them, but I didn't know what it was. I've come to understand what it is almost 45 years later. It's one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. No matter how dense it happened. It's already happened to me today. I sit right over there in that seat over there and listen to Barbara Jonas talk. And what they told me in New and Alcoholics Anonymous is very clear today. Alcoholics Anonymous is the language of the heart. The heart talks and the heart listens. That's why alcoholics 
can help alcoholics. And nobody else has ever been able to help us. I didn't know that. I asked a guy one day, I said, what do you get out of coming up here? Anyhow. I didn't say it like that because I was too cool then. <laughs> I probably used a few of my four-letter words. You look, I said to him, are you some type of a sickle? <laughs> you like to look at the animals in the cages? What's your deal? Anyhow. He looked at me and gave me one of them deep AA answers that just drive people like me crazy. He said, well, son, when you can answer that question, you won't have to ask it. <laughs> I pondered that for a month trying to figure out what he was talking about. I know there's got to be more to it, but in a sentence, the man told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. The simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous sometimes escapes us intellectual giants with brain damage. It just sometimes does. When I can understand why anybody does anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't have to ask those type of questions. When I can understand why anybody will be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous, do anything, general service, central service, meetings, setting up meetings, being on committees, doing things, driving newcomers to meetings, calling on people, making clubs, when I can understand that kind of stuff, I don't have to ask that question because I am doing it. I have fallen into the pattern of doing it, so I don't have to ask, what do you get out of it? Because I've done it. And what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, with going to an average of four or five meetings a week for all these many years, I've learned something that my old sponsor, Norm Alpe, used to talk about. He used to talk about crossing over an invisible line from controlled to uncontrolled drink. I don't have any qualms with that whatsoever. But I'm here to tell you, based on my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is all we have here, there is an invisible line in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're an alcoholic of my type and you don't cross over it, you're going to die drunk. I don't care what anybody tells you. If you don't cross over that line from being a taker to being a giver, you're going to die drunk if you're an alcoholic of my type. And there's a phrase in our book, All Alcoholics Anonymous, that spells out very specifically what that is. The book says that selfishness and self-centeredness, we think, is our problem. And we must be rid of it or it's going to kill us. It doesn't say anything at all about alcohol is our problem. It doesn't say anything at all about drugs being our problem. It says selfishness and self-centeredness is my problem. And if I don't get rid of it, it's going to kill me. Now, I don't understand that sitting in my early meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm so selfish. I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous to make fun of somebody or to get something. That's my motto when I come here. I sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new, and what you proved to me without a shadow of a doubt was that I was not an alcoholic. And you proved to me by saying things like this. I used to drink. Now I don't drink anymore. And everything is just wonderful. <laughs> Back there in inventory point where I sit, my reaction to that was, I guess I'm not alcoholic then. I'm as physically sober as you are, buster, and I'm crazy. God, I wish I was alcoholic, I used to say. If I could just be alcoholic, then all I would have to do is not drink, and I'd be okay. But there's something far more wrong with me than that. And I didn't know what it was. My day came in a mysterious way. I got up one morning. I don't remember being any different than any other day that I got up. It was Sunday morning. The people were coming to the meeting from outside. I didn't know that was the day that I was going to go into a room and somebody was going to unlock the gates of hell and let me out of there. Because I didn't even know I was in hell. If I'd have known that when I woke up that morning, you'd have a different talker here tonight. Because I would have never went to another Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. See, I wasn't familiar with going to Alcoholics for answers. I was considered, I was very adapted going to people who didn't have an answer for me for answers. I'm into the doctors and the psychiatrists and the therapists and the sociologists and the penologists and the lawyers and the teachers and the preachers. And if I'd have known that was my day to be let out of hell, I'd have went to one of them. But see, I wasn't armed with that information. 
And if you're new, you may not be armed with it either. So I went, said where I always sit in my back row. I don't remember my attitude being any different. Watch the little man that I knew. He did 23 years in a penitentiary. Standard of Polity of Alcoholics Anonymous told me something I've never forgotten. It makes more sense to me right now than it made to me then. It'll make more sense to me tomorrow than it is today. He said, very simply, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. You don't have to do it like this no more. Nobody had ever told me that. They'd been telling me since I was that high that I shouldn't drink these things, swallow these things, smoke these things, and shoot these things, but nobody ever told me how to live without doing it. And what none of these great learned people ever seemed to understand, every time they told me that, I was as physically sober as I am right now. How many times I wanted to scream out at them, Good God, doctor, don't you understand? Because they don't. If you're not alcoholic, you'll never understand why I drink. But if you're not alcoholic, I'll never understand why you don't. <laughs> Have you ever watched them or listened to them? Oh, no thanks. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> oh, I have to be home for dinner. I got paid today, you know. The bills are due. Really. <laughs> I walked up to that little man that night, or that day, and I asked him a very simple question. I didn't know what his answer was going to be, but I asked him this very simple question. I said to him, Les, how do you learn how to live? That's all I wanted to know. I wasn't interested in being sober from that day to this day and living this good life and on a journey into a dimension of living that I couldn't even fantasize in my wildest imagination. I never dreamed anything. What I really wanted more than anything else now that I look back, I just wanted to go to sleep and sleep all night long. I didn't want to wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in cold sweats with the picture of my mother standing at my baby brother's gravesite while I'm handcuffed between two detectives right across the road from me. And that look in her eye that I knew I put there. That dream was a recurring nightmare with me, and it went on and on and on and on and on. And he looked at me and gave me an answer that I pray God that we give every newcomer who asks us a question and I'll call it not. He didn't give me any of this cycle babble that you hear about go to 90 meetings for 90 days and don't drink if your butt falls off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be drunk a long, long time before my drunk butt falls off, I can tell you that. I don't like pain. He gave me the answer we should be giving every newcomer. It's the one I give every newcomer that I have the opportunity to work with. He said, Johnny, there is a book called Alcoholics Anonymous in the library. If you go get that book, I'll go home and pray that you find some part of you in it. Guess he prayed real hard, that little fella. I have been a student of our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, from that day to this day. And the only thing I've ever found in that book is me. I haven't looked for anything else. See, I'm not looking for a way to sober up the world, or cure all society's ills. I'm just looking for a way to live peacefully and comfortably and joyously with me and you and God. That's it. And you know what? The closer I adhere to the principles that are written in that book, and the more willing I become to share that knowledge in this fellowship, just for the sheer joy of doing it, the more peaceful and the more comfortable and the more joyous I live with me in the love and God that made me. It's an amazing thing. I didn't open up the book Alcoholics Anonymous to discover I was an alcoholic. I didn't open up the book Alcoholics Anonymous to prove or to stay sober from that day to this day. I opened up the book of Alcoholics Anonymous with a very selfish reason. I was going to prove to you that my case was different, that I wasn't like you. I don't know what I was going to prove, but I was going to prove to you my case was different. And I sit in a room with a man one day, and I'm doing what our program of recovery says is a fifth step. And I heard myself say to that man that I'm an alcoholic. 
But way down deep inside of me it came. And it was a feeling that came over with me that I carry with me right now. You see, as I stand before you tonight, I know exactly what's wrong with me. Isn't that amazing? I'm an alcoholic and I suffer from a disease called alcoholism. I'm not an alcoholic and anything. I'm not an alcoholic or any other thing. I'm just an alcoholic. See, when I was an alcoholic and something or other, I separated me from you. I'm a little better than you, a little slicker than you, a little richer than you, a little poorer than you, a little smarter, a little dumber, but I'm not like you. When I became just like you, or at least like the people who wrote our book, it became my great privilege to be allowed to practice the only program of recovery for alcoholics of my type in 7,000 years of recorded history. This is the only thing that's ever worked for people like me. And I get to do it. That's what blows my mind. I get to do it. I get to go to meetings. I get to have a job at meetings. I get to make coffee at meetings. I get to set meetings up. I get to clean them up. I get to put new guys in my car and drive them around. I get to call my sponsor up and get chewed out. I get to do a lot of things. I don't have to. I just get to. It's a little play on words, but they're very meaningful. Words are very meaningful to me. I walked out of that penitentiary on the fourth day of June, 1961. Next Friday at the time, it would be 43 years. I didn't have a clue what the world was like outside of an institution or outside of a street corner with a gang. I was armed with only one thing. In the 19 months that I was studying our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in that penitentiary, a dream came to me. And I completed the first nine steps of my program of recovery to the best of my ability. And that experienced some of the promises. But there was a dream that formed in my head that maybe someday, maybe someday, I never knew when, but maybe someday you good people would allow me to come and sit with you. I never allowed my thought, my wildest imagination, you'd let me sit with you. I thought maybe you'd make me sit outside somewhere or in a balcony someplace by myself. Because I didn't think you'd let a thing like me come and sit with you good people and be around your family. But I said to myself, if they will give me the extreme privilege of coming and sitting in their meetings, I'll do anything they ask me to do. I'm very pleased to be allowed to tell you tonight that next Friday, 43 years of my life, I have done whatever it is that Alcoholics Anonymous has asked me to do. And the reason is very simple. I've been given a great deal here. I have been exposed to and have embraced to no effort of my own the whole set of promises that are in our book after the ninth step. I have been allowed to become type of extremely serviceable to Alcoholics Anonymous. I can, I can do things in AA. I can make coffee or set up the meeting. I can go serve on panels at institutions. I can do a lot of things. But I didn't know anything about a fellowship when I walked out of the penitentiary. I knew all about a program of recovery, but I knew nothing about a fellowship. I didn't know how to operate on one, so I went to a meeting one night, and a guy walked up to me and said, I'm going to be your sponsor. And I just looked at him. I said, what's that? He said, well, I'm going to help you get things done that need to be done. I just looked at him. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, why did you ask me? I said, you just told me you were going to be my sponsor. (laughs) He looked at me and he said, Johnny, if I can't run my life, what makes you think I can run yours? (laughs) Then I asked him another question. I'm, I'm trying to trick him. I said, then what am I supposed to do? He said, why don't you do what I do? Now, I'm really getting frustrated. I said to him, what is it you do? He says, well, if you do what I do, then you'll know what I do. (laughs) I just cleared up 
the great mystery of sponsorship to you. <laughs> you don't ever have to figure out what the fool's doing anymore. You follow him around. If he's staying sober. Do what he does, and you'll be alright. First thing he said, old Norm said to me, get a job and go to work. You're a bum. I said, I'm not a bum. He said, what are you? I said, I'm an AA member. He said, no, you're an AA bum. <laughs> Bums don't work. You better get off of welfare, too. I said, don't you ever say that to me again, Norm Alfie. I'll hit you. I ain't never been on welfare. He said, what do you call living in a penitentiary? Self-supporting through your own contribution? <laughs> Jeez. Then I went to work. Got a job. You know somebody stole my first paycheck? <laughs> Things are looking good. I'm working. Wife's come back, got that little girl I'd never seen. You got a job? Got a paycheck? I don't know what to do with a paycheck. What do you do when you get paid? I don't know what to do with it. I never had a paycheck before. I'm a thief. So I went home and told her, let's go to the market. She said, well, why do you want to go to the market? I said, that's what they do when they get paid. <laughs> she said, who are you talking about? And I said, them. I've watched them, you know. <laughs> so we went to the market. We put the little girl in the basket and pushed her around there, sitting backward, I'm feeling good. She's tearing cookie packets open. I'm playing daddy. I don't know how to be one, but I'm playing like one. <laughs> went up to the cash register. He took that money of mine. And that really bothered me. I mean, I got to pay for stuff. Then we went home, and I asked for somebody to get a haircut, and somebody had stole her purse. Now, if you want to hear somebody scream, you ought to hear a thief when they get stolen from them. <laughs> so I hollered and ranted and raved. If I'd have caught that guy, you'd have another speaker here tonight. <laughs> I finally got all through, and I sat down and have a cup of coffee. She said to me, you all through? And I said, yes, I am. She says, now you know how it feels. Oh. I don't want to know how it feels. I want revenge. <laughs> you know what? I went back to work that afternoon. I've been working ever since. And life's still pretty good. I'd like to tell you that every meal I've eaten has been a banquet, and every day I've lived out there on the sunny side of the street. Now, I live out there in the world where the world is the world. You know, I'm, you know, my mother, the day I got out of the penitentiary, fell off the steps blind drunk. I picked her up and put her on a couch and said, Mom, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, fine, I think you should. I like to tell you, my mother got sober and my dog got sober and my cat got sober and we're the sober sobers, but that's really not my experience. My mother drank herself to death. While I'm sitting safely nestled in your arms in Alcoholics Anonymous, I watch my mother drink herself to death. Powerless to do anything about it at all. Powerless. The grave, it took her 30 years, but she finally made it. And what I learned from my mother's tragedy was very simple. I don't have the power to get anybody sober. I don't have any power to get them drunk either. I don't even have any power to keep me sober. Where would I get it? I didn't come in here blazing with power. I came here with as much power 45 years ago as I have tonight. I'm powerless. My book tells me I'm powerless. And I've come to understand I'm powerless. I'm given some type of a power on a daily basis that allows me to live in a world of love and service. That's it. I was the last thing in this world my mother ever saw. I knelt at her bedside and held her hand and watched my mother go wherever they go. You know, I... There was nothing between my mother and I. There was no bitterness no more. I guess my mother never had forgiven me for my baby brother. I don't know. But there was nothing between me and my mother because of this magnificent program of recovery. And when my mother died, she just died. And my wife and mother of my children committed suicide right before my fifth day of birthday. I don't know how to handle that. I don't know what brought it about. I was left to raise two children, and I don't know anything about two little girls. I don't know anything about raising children. I'm a gangster. I hang out in the street corners. I hurt people. 
So I treated them like drunks. And they turned out pretty good. My youngest daughter just spent a little time studying over at Cambridge University in England. She's seven years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. My oldest daughter, something really wrong with her. She's not alcoholic. <laughs> She's a registered nurse. I got four grandsons. Number three, <laughs> just got out of jail. I told my daughter, don't name him Jonathan. But my sponsor, Norm, taught me the business about living in Alcoholics Anonymous because I didn't know. He would yell at me and tell me to shut up and sit still. He wouldn't let me get up and wander around. He's just an amazing man. I'd have to ride. He wouldn't let me drive a car because I didn't have a driver's license. When I said, why can't I get a car? He said, Johnny, citizens like me have a right to be protected from jerks like you. <laughs> I never thought about things like that. And I said, I never got arrested for driving a car without a license. He said, how would you know? You haven't had a driver's license since 1940-something. Been suspended from my natural life. I told him, my driver's license has been suspended for the rest of my natural life. He said, then you won't drive a car for the rest of your natural life. Jeepers. I didn't see anything wrong with driving a car without a driver's license until he told me. He says, if you drive a car and start breaking these rules, Johnny, it won't be long before you're drunk. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. But the time came when I got a job. And I couldn't get to work if I didn't have a car. So I went down and told my parole officer, I gotta have, you know, I gotta have some permit to drive. I gotta get somewhere back and forth to work. You gonna make me work or send me back to the penitentiary? I got a job. I can't get there if I don't get a driver's license. So he gave me a permit to drive an automobile. So I called old Norm up. I said to him, Norm, Norm, I'm going to get a car. I've got a permit to drive. He said, do you have money for insurance? I said, no. He said, then you can't get the car. <laughs> Gee, time came when I had the permit to drive and I had the money for the insurance. I didn't call him up. I just went out and bought a car. Drove it over his house, drove it up on his front lawn and honked the horn. He came wandering out of there looking at me, looking at that car. And what he said to me is really, really very significant to me today. It didn't make much sense to me. He said, Johnny, maybe you're just starting to understand that there isn't a damn thing special about you just because you got sober. That you get no special compensation being a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You just get to go out there and be of love and be of service. Because you got a lot of payback to do. An awful lot of payback. You're not starting even with the people who've been doing it for their lifetime. You're coming from behind and you'll always be behind. Maybe you're starting to understand that you're in the damn thing spot for special about you whatsoever. And he was right. I used to go to meetings with him. I'd sit in meetings, listen to him talk. He's the best talker of all economists I've ever had. If you ever get an opportunity to listen to one of Norm Alpey's tapes, listen to it. He's the best talker AA's ever had or ever will have. And I went to a meeting with him one night, and I'm two or three years sober out of the penitentiary. I'm getting a little frisky now because I'm in the panel and I'm doing things. Staying back by the literature table at the coffee break, and some guy walked up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Johnny, I turned around, and I'm looking at him, and he said, do you know you're a miracle? I said, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> you know how humble we are. <laughs> what was it I said that made you think that? <laughs> <laughs> he went on about, oh, yeah, I'm on your own, on your own, man. I'm getting higher and higher, and my head's getting bigger and bigger. And after the coffee break, I flew in there and sat in my seat and waited for my sponsor to speak. And all the time he's speaking, I'm looking out the window because I'm looking for my spaceship to take me back home. <laughs> Norm is watching me. I got that glazed over look in my eyes. We're on the way home, we're driving down the road. Of course, he's driving because I don't have a driver's license. He looked at me and he said, I'm staring out the window. I'm looking for my star. Whatever I'm, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'm gone. And he said to me, 
Jackass, what's the matter with you? Have you been smoking that stuff? And I said to him, Norm, I don't think you're going to understand this, but I am a miracle. <laughs> Norm didn't laugh about that. He slammed on the brakes, almost ran into the divider, and screamed at me. You're what? I said, I'm a miracle. He said, where do you get this nonsense, Johnny? I said, it's an Amy. From an Amy. He says, you're not a miracle, jackass. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous is the miracle, and you're just a small part of it. Now, I don't know what that does for all the miracles in Stockholm, <laughs> but I can tell you what it's done for me. It's kept me small enough to stay here. You can't possibly imagine what an egotist like me would do if I thought I was a miracle. I just, it's just amazing. I'd probably be starting up some thing in Waco. Make them do it right this time. I just, I have that type of an ego. I know that. That's why after all these years, I still have to have a sponsor who's stronger than my head. I still need to go to four or five meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous a week. I still need to study our book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I still need to do whatever it is that Alcoholics Anonymous asked me to do, whether it's get on an airplane or sweep the floor. I just do whatever it is I'm asked to do around here. And to some total, it, I live a life beyond anybody's wildest imagination. You can't possibly imagine what a good life I live. Do you know what it's like to live all day long with no thought of yourself whatsoever? I do. I know exactly what it's like. I have lived all day long and wanted nothing for myself whatsoever. You know what it's like to love somebody more than you love yourself? Totally unconditionally. I do. I live with a woman like that that I love more than myself. It's amazing what has happened to me. You know what it's like to look at your children and look at one of God's creations and smile at it and realize that you've had nothing to do with it whatsoever except to set an example for them. What a great thing. The book says very simply, we will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. That's in the promises. It's an, it's an insinuation that you have worked your way through the program of recovery up to and to the ninth step when you comprehend the word serenity and you will know peace. That no matter how far down the road you've gone, you can see where your experience can benefit others. It's a great fact, brother. What do we have in Alcoholics Anonymous? I have my experience of staying sober for over 40 some years. I've had my experience of sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous four or five times a week for all these years. I've had the experience of, of doing whatever it is that Alcoholics Anonymous or my sponsor has asked me to do. And as I'm told of it, uh, you know, I'm about as happy as the world I'm going to get. My life is really very good. Really very good. I just told you a bunch of it. My sponsor, Norm, died the day before my 22nd birthday. The toughest year of my life was when I started running my own life. Thought I had the very best and didn't need help. So one day I said in Clancy's office, and I asked Clancy that, I said, uh, I need a sponsor. I thought he was going to put his glasses down on his nose and say, what an order, I can't go through with it. <laughs> but he said to me, okay, we'll give it a whirl. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I want you to come to the Wednesday night meeting and I want you to call me every day. Okay. 21 years has come and gone. I still go to the Wednesday night meeting every week when I'm in town and I still call him every day. The guy said to me, you mean to tell me you still call your sponsor every day? And I said, yeah. He said, why? And I said, he hasn't told me not to yet. <laughs> basically that simple with me. It's a monkey see, monkey do deal here. It really is. But you got to pick the right monkey. That's the only thing. I mean, you don't want the monkey who don't do nothing. Sits around and eats bananas all the time. Talks about how bad everything is except for the banana. You want a monkey who's up there climbing a tree picking the bananas. 
putting some effort into life, doing things about it. If you're new in alcoholics, I find somebody who's sober, who looks like they got some type of joyousness about them, because that's what Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of recovery, promises people like me, if I will be strenuous in my efforts about this program, I will know a peace and a comprehension of things that I have never dreamed possible, and they're true. Absolutely and totally true. I have a God of my very own. My very own God. Not my grandmother's God who told me God punished little boys who were bad. I have a God who does not favor me over anybody else. What would make anybody possibly think that God would favor us over anybody else? What about the poor guy down the street that can't get sober? What about the poor guy we talked about today, the newcomer, who can't buy this deal two or three days at a time and gone again? What? God favors me over him? I don't want anything to do with a God like that. When I was new, my old papa Chuck Chamberlain used to say to me, son, we're all God's kids. If I am, you are, and if you are, I am. And I said to him, what do God's kids do, Pop? He said, oh, they just wander around and try to help God's kids get things done that need to be done. And they do it for free, and they do it for fun. What a tremendous concept for living. I have come to understand in Alcoholics Anonymous that another thing he told me was that nature abhorbs a vacuum, but God abhorbs a vacuum even more under heaven and earth. He told me that if I could empty myself of self, I would be automatically full of God. Now, what happens to me when I come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous has already happened to me before I ever came to this podium. I sat right over there in that chair. I saw Frederick open the meeting. So Nicholas read the fifth chapter. I saw Patrick, as an afterthought, read the preamble. I don't judge. Her man read the twelve traditions. Said her barber talk. Jonas talk. And you know, even though I'm an American and I don't understand much squeezing, I understood what they were talking about. But while these people were doing this thing, I was more interested in them and their thing than I was in myself. And in those brief moments of my life, I'm about as close to God as I'm ever going to get. I'm never going to be any closer to God than that. Because that's what my papa taught me. Empty yourself of self. And you can do it by a number of ways in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the whole secret, if I could put another name on the disease of alcoholism, it would be selfishness and self-centeredness. Because I can look back over 43 years of experience of living out there in the world, and every jackpot that I have got myself into whether it's business failure, whether it's an adulterous affair, no matter what it has been, all those years that I've been sober, it has to do, I can put it right back to my selfishness and my self-centeredness. It had nothing to do with drinking. It had to do with my selfishness and self-centeredness. And I'm not one of those type of people who say, well, I'm an alcoholic, you know. <laughs> That's no excuse for bad behavior once you've been to AA. Life is a very good thing. Every living thing I have in my life, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. Every living thing I may ever hope to have in my life, I owe to Alcoholics Anonymous. And dear friends, you better believe this. This is a long, long walk from a cell in solitary confinement in a maximum security penitentiary to where I stand right now. But for the grace of God, AA and good friends like Frederick, I could have missed it all. Thank you very much. Everybody, my name's Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Until I'm a good drunk, I got a drink in my hand. I uh, before I get, I didn't offend you, did I? Yes, clearly. <laughs> if you'd had as many shock treatments as I had, you wouldn't touch anything that had electricity in it. <laughs> 
I want to thank uh, the committee and all the people who've been uh, extremely kind and generous in their time and efforts to uh, walk me half to death, <laughs> make me step over horse poop, and do all kinds of things like that. But uh, the hospitality of uh, to these people, these fine people in uh, Stockholm has just absolutely blown my mind. And if you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous today, uh, I want to let you know before I ever get started that I'm not a consultant, a counselor, or authority on a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm an example, good, bad, or indifferent, that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works. That it hasn't been necessary for me to drink anything, smoke anything, stick anything in my arm, have any antidepressant drugs, no near beer, nothing in my system stronger than an aspirin since some time before the fourth day of November, 1959. Now, that's a long time between drinks. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so dry I think I'm a fire hazard, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you ought to see the candles on my birthday cake. I mean, the last time Clancy gave me a cake, I thought I was going to singe my eyebrows off or something. Just, <laughs> But I got to stay sober for all this period of time because of a number of reasons. Uh, last night I went into great deal, great detail about what I was like, and what had happened to me, what I'm trying to be like today. But there's some very, very important things that have happened to me in my journey in alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, most of you know I, I took a drink of alcohol when I was nine years old, and I didn't realize then that it had a special effect in me. It does something for me that it doesn't do for maybe nine out of the other ten people who drank. And I pursued that illusion that they talk about in my book, Into the Gates of Insanity and Death and Beyond, because I went insane one day, standing in front of a superior court judge, in Los Angeles, California, on my second sentencing to a state penitentiary. And what that judge said to me was that I was a blood-sucking parasite in society and that I had no right being around decent people. He told a woman who was sitting in the courtroom who was pregnant with my oldest child that if she cared anything about that child at all, she would never let me lay eyes on her. Now, he didn't say anything to me or anything to that courtroom that I hadn't said to myself time and time and time and time again. But the first time I ever heard it in an open courtroom, it did what to an alcoholic what an alcoholic would do when he's overburdened with the truth about himself. And the exposure of the truth to a room full of people, my brain exploded. And I spent the next eight or nine months of my life crawling around in a cell in solitary confinement in the maximum security penitentiary. That's what it finally left. See, that's what being sober for a period of time and facing up with the truth did to me. That's what sobriety was to me. Sobriety was a nightmare. Sobriety was the, the reoccurrent nightmares of the tragedies and the atrocities that I had committed on my selfish, self-centered journey through this thing called life, and I didn't know what we were doing, and, and it had driven me right up into, and maybe into a, a depth of hell that very few people will probably ever understand. And if it had been in my depth moment, standing in front of that judge, if he'd have said to me, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd have thrown something at him because there was no reason for me to go because I knew what my answer was. My answer was that sooner or later, somebody's going to blow my brains out in one of those street alleys that I lived in, or I was going to spend the rest of my life locked up in some type of an institution somewhere. Because that had been my prognosis, that had been my evaluation from the psychiatrists and the therapists and the penologists and the penologists, and the lawyers, and the teachers, and the preachers, and the coaches, for as far back as I could ever remember. There was a psychiatrist in, in the San Quentin State Penitentiary in 1951. 
who tried to talk me into a lobotomy. Because he said, son, you're going to die in a penitentiary. People like you are going to die in a penitentiary. Now, I don't know what kind of grace that was looking over me. I do know that my little grandmother prayed for me every day of her life. And I do know that some of her grace stepped over me, but on a deathbed in the old Los Angeles County Jail, I uttered out the only prayer I ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. I can see from the utterance of that prayer to this very moment, my journey through life, how it's taken a different direction and how it's went into a different type of direction. Now, I didn't... There's one thing that I have come to understand in the almost 45 years that I've been hanging around you. My little grandmother's prayers may have been some type of a protective agent that helped me until I got here. But I know as well as I'm standing here that if I hadn't asked God for help, I would have never gotten it. I had to ask for it. I had to ask, oh, please, God, help me. Not even knowing what I'm looking for, not even knowing what I'm asking about, not even knowing what I'm searching for, I just want God to help me. I thought for a long time I was praying for death. But in short order, what it did, it brought me life because it brought me to you on that fateful day of November 1959. And what happened to me is a story all its own. It's the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not my story. It's the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. A man walked into a penitentiary one day and told me I didn't have to live like that anymore if I didn't want to. And that is the secret and the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. People have been telling me all my life that I shouldn't do certain things, I shouldn't act certain ways, and I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. But this man told me that I didn't have to live like that anymore, and none of those people who had diagnosed me and shocked me and hit me with high-pressure fire hoses and tried to get me to commit to a lobotomy and all these other kind of miracle things to cure for people they don't understand. This man made more sense to me, a little guy that had 23 flat years in the penitentiary who was my baseball coach when I was a star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates. Now, I don't understand why this is, but I've come to understand what that is. This man, through God's grace and his actions and his dedication to service in Alcoholics Anonymous, was so busy trying to give away what he found that he was the essence, the package that Alcoholics Anonymous came to me in. And what he said was, you don't have to live like this anymore. He didn't say, I know what's wrong with you. In essence, he said the magic word to an alcoholic of my type. I know how you feel. And you don't have to do it like this no more. And he gave me the magic ingredient. He he brought a singleness of purpose to me that uh, and the people who came with him brought a singleness of purpose, which is the essence of what Alcoholics Anonymous is really all about tonight. One alcoholic talks to another alcoholic. And even though they don't know the words, they understand. We understand one another. Not maybe by the word, maybe we talk different languages, maybe we talk different dialects. We understand this magic language of the heart. And we know more than anything else. When somebody from the depth of their soul tells you, another alcoholic, if an alcoholic tells you this, I know exactly how you feel. And if anybody's ever said that to you in the depth of your despair, you're hooked. There's no way to get around it. That is the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The singleness of purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is what separates us from everything else in the world. Now, in the 7,000 years of recorded history, my sponsor tells me, there's only been a couple of answers for the disease of alcoholism. One of them happened in the 1840s. A group of five little guys got together in a little bar in Baltimore, Maryland, and decided that they should talk to one another. If they tried to help one another, they could stay sober. And people thought they were nuts. They thought, what do you mean? You're all drunks, for Christ's sake. How are you ever going to stay sober? You're all crazy drunk. All you're going to do is drink with one another. Well, they took the name 
of the president, first president of the United States, Washington, called himself the Washingtonian Movement. And they grew in numbers in the first two or three years of existence, faster than any spiritual movement in the history of mankind. They stretched out over the East Coast of the United States without the benefits of television, communication, just word of mouth, word by word, one out of cup. Now, somebody estimates some of the numbers of this thing of over 300,000 people in a short period of time. Short period of time. But somewhere along the line, one of these geniuses, who was an alcoholic, who was in the thing called the Washingtonian group, got the bright idea that if we could help alcoholics, why can't we help everybody? Why can't we just go out and save the world and save all the pitiful and comprehensible immoralization of the world? Why can't we help opium addicts? Why can't we help all these people? So they started on a tirade. And they got into politics. They got into public speaking. They got their names put in newspapers. They got the vine for speaking engagement. They let this alcoholism, this seemingly selfish, egotism-driven thing that I have, carry them into heights and depravity that we can't even dream about. And then three, four, four short years, they completely extinguished themselves from the face of the earth. And what they did in a small terms is they lost their singleness of purpose. They got the singleness of purpose and they lost it because they, they got some type of a, it's not a bad idea, it's a very, it's a very thoughtful idea. But, the thing that alcoholics get sober for in Alcoholics Anonymous is what that man said to me, I understand how you feel. I understand, I recognize your dilemma. Yeah, I'm like that. What have you done? What should you do for me? The singleness of purpose. The purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is I've come to understand it. The purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous, any gathering of Alcoholics Anonymous, is I understand it. It's to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now, the alcoholic who still suffers doesn't necessarily mean it's the guy that's not here. There's probably people in this room who are suffering from the disease of alcoholism. And they have some type of a knowledge of idea that it, just because they're not drinking, they got it whipped. If that was the case, we wouldn't need alcoholics now. But we have a singleness of purpose. The singleness of purpose, my singleness of purpose, my book tells me, is to stay sober and carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffer. To build a, some type of a, a bridge of understanding between me and some other person. That's why Bill in his infinite wisdom wrote to us. In our book, we share our experience, strength, and hope here. Because experience is what we were like. And the newcomers got to know what we were like. They got to know what happened to us and what's, what we're like today. What are we doing about that today? They don't want to know what I used to be like, 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 what I used to be like. They'd like to know what happened, for God's sake. I remember one time... There's this friend of mine, uh, he was new, and in my part of the world, every once in a while they asked me to go out and talk, and I, I take one of these uh, jackasses that I'm sponsoring, and I drag this goof and put him in the car with me, and I tell him that when you get there, you're going to do a 10-minute talk. He said, okay. So he got up there, and he went 20 minutes or so of what he was like, what he was like, what he was like, and what he was like, and what he was like, and what he was like. And he sat down and he says, Jeeps, Lance, I didn't get to tell him what I'm like today. I said, they know. <laughs> it's true. I mean, if you're like it, what you were like, what you were like, not much has changed. The man introduced me to, uh, the tool that allows you and I to sit in this room tonight without a garbled message of what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is, and don't you believe for a single moment that it's not being garbled in various places around the world. And the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is in a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, at least in the first 164 pages. 
And it spells out very specifically what happens to us and what we're supposed to be doing here. It was written by a man called Bill Wilson, and a lot of people, maybe a lot of people in Stockholm, understand and believe that Bill Wilson had a spiritual experience through no experience of his own. He just had one because God thought he ought to have it, so he could write it in a book. Nothing could be further from the truth than that. If you were to read Bill's story, you would find out that before Bill had what he called his hot flash, that's what he called it. I didn't pick it out of there. He just called it a hot flash. A lot of people have had hot flashes if they can have spiritual experiences. My wife has them from time to time. <laughs> She's not having a spiritual experience. She's just having a hot flash. It's her time of the world, I guess. I don't He essentially, in his story, worked the first nine steps of our program of recovery before he had his spiritual awakening. And when Bill first got sober and started carrying the message, for the first six months he was sober, everybody he drug into his house didn't get sober. None of them got sober. I mean, one guy committed suicide in his living room. Another guy stole furniture and sold it for Muscatel wine. And Bill was getting ready to go find AA number two down in Akron, Ohio. And Dr. Silkward, one of AA's dearest friends, said to him, why don't you quit preaching this spiritual experience business and start talking to people about the, the physical allergy of alcoholism? And Dr. Bob was the first guy he tried that on. First guy. First. And there's an interesting story about Dr. Bob because they became a we instead of an I. And so for the first time in the history of mankind, there were two people in Alcoholics Anonymous, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson. But Dr. Bob was kind of a rebel kind of guy like me. And Dr. Bob told Bill Wilson, his sponsor, I'm not going to work those men's steps. I'm not going to work eight and nine. Because I've lived in this town all my life and I'm still practicing medicine here and I'm not going to let that lay my dirty linen out in front of these people to see. And Bill, like any good sponsor, just shrugged his shoulders. So my guess your case is different. You don't have to do this, which seems to be the theme song of everybody who dies drunk here. And a couple of weeks later, Dr. Bob went to Atlantic City on a medical convention and fell off the trunk truck train when he got back in Akron, dead drunk. And the next day, Bill did something that from time to time I wanted my sponsor to do for me, but he never would. So Dr. Bob was going to have to go have an operation. He was doing the shakes and the whippies. And Bill gave him a beer. Now, I've tried to talk my sponsor into that from time to time. <laughs> he doesn't think that's a good idea for me. <laughs> but he went out, and, and Bob left and went out somewhere. And, and after the operation, he was missing. He was gone all day and waiting late into the evening. He finally showed up. And people said, where were you? We were worried about you. I thought maybe we would drink. He said, I was out mending fences. In other words, he had finally got beat into a state of reasonable enough when he was ready to go out and clean up the wreckage of his past, which is another single list of purpose here. And from that, he lived until the day he would die. And in his last talk in Alcoholic Anonymous, he voiced a word of caution to us way back there in 1950, which is, 50 some, 50 some years ago he voiced a word of caution he said let's not louse this thing up the fruit and intellect that has no earthly use to anything but the mind let's remember that Alcoholics Anonymous has always been broke down into two simple words love and service and you got to remember that somebody took the time out of their life to carry the message to you so let's just keep it that simple. It's basically that simple. One alcoholic talks to another alcoholic and gets them to create and do actions that they never have any idea about doing. It don't seem right to me. My sponsor 
told me to do things that I said didn't have anything to do with alcoholism. He told me to do things that were not written in that book. See, I knew the book, because I studied it for 19 months. I went through those steps sitting in a penitentiary all by myself with the help of a couple of other guys. But I, he gave me action. He told me that I should, I should go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous all the time. He told me that I should have a job in every meeting that I go to. He said, you know, you got to do this. You got to get there early. You got to stay there late and you got to sit down and shut up. I said, why? <laughs> I may want to visit with old Martin over there. Why should I shut up? He says, Johnny, have you ever stopped to think that maybe somebody else wants to listen? I said, no, I haven't. He said, I didn't think so. Selfish, self-centered people, like you don't think about anybody but yourself. Why don't you just shut up? Pay attention. Well, I didn't like that. When you're new, you don't want to shut up. You want people to notice you. I was telling some people at coffee this morning, I, I was a year or so out of the penitentiary, and some guy asked me to go give a talk, one of those ten-minute talks with the speaker. And I'm all excited about that. I went out and bought me a necktie even. I was just really going to make a splash, my debut in Alcoholics Anonymous. I called my sponsor up, and I said, Norm. Norm, he said, what do you want, jackass? I said, oh, so-and-so has asked me to go give a little ten-minute talk with him. He's given the main talk. What do you think about that, man? He said, well, that's okay, John. I said, what do you think I ought to tell him, Norm? He said, why don't you tell him your name and your sobriety date? You don't know anything else. <laughs> Which is true. Which is absolutely true. What do you know? One year sober. Uh, what I was like, what I was like, what I was like, what I was like, and what I was like. Today, we got people... Coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, they've been told, you got to go to A and share. you got to share, yeah. Get it out. I walked up to me the other day and said that. I want to share. I said, mop the floor. <laughs> you ought to saw the look on his face. What has that got to do with sharing? I said, that's about the best sharing I know of. <laughs> Grab a mop. It's all relevant about what service is in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not everybody gets to talk. But there's a job if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous or old or medium in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a job in Alcoholics Anonymous for you to do. It's your job. And if you don't do it, it will never get done. I don't know what it is. So if you're wondering what it is, I suggest you try everything once. I suggest you try simple service, general service, sweeping floors, setting up meetings, leading meetings, reading the book. Do all this stuff around here that, that's essential to keep your mind off yourself. And sooner or later you'll fall into a pattern of whatever your job is you're supposed to do around here. I'm a coffee maker by trade. That's what I do. I make coffee for 800 or 1,000 people every Wednesday night. You know, they never say that's good coffee. <laughs> They never walk in and pat me on the back and say, what a wonderful job you're doing back here, young man. Now, when I was new and doing things, they did that. When I was new, I was back there in the kitchen washing cups, sweeping the floor. Old timers would walk up and tap me on the back and say, oh, you're doing a good job, newcomer. Keep it up. Pat me on the back. Now I'm 40-some years sober, and I'm still picking up chairs in my home group and making coffee, and you know what they say? Look at that old son of a gun. He's still trying to run everything around here. <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast. It, it, it's an absolute necessity. My sponsor, I, I have a, a, a sponsor. I had a sponsor who was probably the meanest man who ever lived. But he loved me more than I can possibly ever imagine loving anybody. He cared more about saving my life than he did about hurting my feelings. He did. I caught, I used to call him up in the middle of the night because I just wanted to see if he'd answer the phone. <laughs> so I didn't want anything. I'd have to make something up as I was on the phone. And I'd say things to him like, Norm, what do you want, jackass? Some of us have to work tomorrow. <laughs> well, that hurt. 
But that didn't deter me from my journey. Norm, I'd say to him, he'd say, what do you want? And I'd say, Norm, my program ain't working, Norm. He'd say, why don't you try ours and hang up? Jesus. He'd say, hey, then I'd call him back. Try to get him to, you know what he'd say to me? Jackass, your program never did work. You know what my program is? My program at the ripe old age of 26 or 27 years old got me crawling around in a cell in solitary confinement at a maximum security penitentiary, drifting in and out of total insanity. That's my program. That's my best program. Now, on a part-time basis, trying to incorporate our program into my life, I'm a happy, joyous, free individual. I'm of service. I got a purpose and a direction for being. I got a, a direction for God. I got a thing to do. I've got people to see and places to go. I got a lovely family. I got a couple of beautiful daughters. I got four great grandkids. I got a lovely wife. I love death living in my home waiting for me. A little dog. You ought to see me sometime. I got a little gray dog. She's about that tall. She wears purple leash. Got a purple halter. Got little purple things in her hair when I get her done. And I take her down to a store called Petco, California. You can take your dogs in there. I take her down and let her pick out her toys. She grabs one, hangs on to it, looks at me, and I go buy it. And all the time I'm doing that, I'm singing to myself. If they could see me now. That old gang of mine. It's a funny thing. I can't imagine ever walking back into the penitentiary and saying, you ought to see me walking my little gray dog down here at Petco Saturday. Yeah. But life is a wonderful thing. You know what? I tell you, I had, I had a great experience about two months ago. Two months ago, I was invited to go back and talk in the, in the state penitentiary at Folsom, where I was a visitor there for a period of time, 46 years ago. And I got to go there, and I was going to talk to the to the inmates or the convict, whatever you want to do. And when we got there, we were a little ahead of schedule, and we couldn't get through the one place to get to the other place. And so we stopped right outside of the old mess hall I used to eat in 46 years ago. And right down the hall from that place was a cell block that I lived in 46 years ago. I walked down to that cell block and walked three cells down on the left of the cell that I lived in 46 years ago. And I walked across that mess hall that I ate in to a cafeteria where they fed the free people and sit down and spent four hours with 300 convicts, people just like me. And all I could tell them was, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. Because I used to sit on that back row just like you did. I was as full of much skepticism and criticism and doubtfulness as anybody who lived upon the face of the earth. But one day a man who was dedicated to Alcoholics Anonymous and to the service of it, who had fulfilled the conditions of sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous, was willing to give up his time and his effort and come to a penitentiary and tell me that I didn't have to live like that anymore, so I did it for you. And I don't know, it gave me a funny feeling. One of the free people said to me, what's it like after all these years? And I said, same. Hasn't changed, smells the same. She said, what do you mean the smell? I said, you can smell the fear. It's gripped in fear. Everybody's afraid that everybody's going to find out that they're afraid. And if that's not my entire story, I don't know what it is. I've had opportunities. I know sometimes, sometimes I almost get to thinking that I never had a break. That I was doomed from time, but it's not true. I've had people come into institutions where I was at and offer me scholarships to universities. I had a, a talent to play baseball that's beyond belief sometimes. An arm that could throw a ball through a wall, a bat, a baseball that I could hit no matter how hard they threw it. I could run like a deer. I could do a lot of things. And 
scouts and universities came in to see me at reform schools and offered me scholarship to go to the university. But I walked out of an institution as physically sober as I am right now and took a drink. And then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me. And playing baseball in a penitentiary against Major League Baseball players, a scout from the St. Louis Cardinals came in there and offered me a trial at their training camp when I got out of the penitentiary for the St. Louis Cardinals. But I walked out of there and took a drink, and then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me, and I never got to St. Louis. See, I never went anywhere when I drank. I have never stopped drinking. My sponsor is probably a great, a great, great reason that I'm standing here tonight. Because even though I was armed with the knowledge of what Alcoholics Anonymous is, and I had incorporated the program of recovery into my life, I didn't know how to behave around you. I didn't know that my actions may affect the newcomer sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that my doubtfulness and my criticism and my the way I dressed and the way I acted and the way I behaved and my snobbishness and my self-centeredness was going to affect the newcomer. I never realized that my purpose in life is to install some type of hope and some type of message to the newcomer because I've come to understand that the real payoff in Alcoholics Anonymous is not staying sober. That's not the payoff. If you don't get the payoff, you're never going to stay sober anyhow if you're an alcoholic. The payoff is to watch somebody get this thing that was given to you and watch it come out of them. Watch this light come on in their eyes. My papa used to say to return from the land of the living dead to the land of the living. That's the payoff in alcohol. It doesn't make any difference whether you sponsor them whether you know them or whether you don't know them. You can sit over there in that chair where I sit there and watch these two fine people get up here and talk about what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for them. And something happens to me because I understand what's happened to them. And I'm able to transpose what's happened to me to them and them to me, which is what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. That's the singleness of purpose. One alcoholic talks to another alcoholic. And that's the way it worked. My sponsor taught me that. And the second thing he taught me more than anything else is the importance of a home group. It's important for me to be somewhere all the time where I say I'm going to be. It's important for me to sit in the same chair in my home group. I've sat in the same chair on Monday night for the last 33 years, every single Monday. I can count on my hand the number of times I've missed that meeting. And it's never been because of a business thing. It's never been because of a family obligation. It's never been any other excuse. The only time I've ever missed that thing is when I was in the hospital with an operation. That's the only time I've missed that meeting. I can't understand why I can't be there. My sponsor told me. And it's another thing. Where am I going to tell the guys I sponsor? Come on over here and get in this group and do these things. My sponsor took me down by the hand and set me down and said, this is it. Be here. Wash them cups and sweep these floors and pick up them chairs. I told him, I want to do something here. He gave me something to do. See, I didn't know when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, because I'm like all people who come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I come here seeking something. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get something. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a getting program. No matter how far down the scale you've gone, if you came into this room tonight, you brought every single thing you need in here with you. All you got to do is uncover, discover, and discard the situation. It's what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is really all about. It's what our book is all about. And in a home group, what I have found, I have found people there who know me better than I know myself. I've had people that I sponsor walk up to me and say, what's wrong with you? What do you mean, what's wrong with me? Well, you look like you're mad at something. You look like you swallowed something. You look like you ate a persimmon or something. What's the matter with you, sponsor? Jesus. 
I'm not supposed to talk to your sponsor like that. <laughs> only, only if you know that your sponsor is a human being, and all human beings have feet of clay. All the people that I sponsor have ever done for me is just make me be better than I really am, at least behave better than I am. So when somebody walks up and that I sponsor, I, I got to straighten up. After all, I am the sponsor. <laughs> I guess that's where the old ego takes over. That's the importance of a home group. It's very important. I guess there's a, there's a thing that they do in my home group. I don't know where it started, but it started now and, and the people are picking up. It's almost like, it's almost like a thing that they do. We have basically the same format on Monday night that you have here. And every single person who gets up here and gives a talk always says, the three most important things in my life is a sobriety date, a home group, and a sponsor. In that order. Isn't it amazing? Think about it. If you don't have a sobriety date, it can't be very important. If you don't have a home group, nobody will ever get to know you. If you don't have a sponsor, you'll never have anybody to lead you down the path. It's a very simple thing. Singleness of purpose, a home group, sponsorship. They're all very wonderful things. But, you know, to be a sponsor, I suppose, requires a lot of time and a lot of effort. You know, and if you don't know this, I'm going to tell you. There is a big difference between saying you have a sponsor and being sponsored. And if you don't know the difference for that, you may be in a lot of trouble. A lot of people, I bet I tell them today having coffee. I have people call me from somewhere across the country and say, Oh, so-and-so is by here and says, you're a sponsor. I don't even know who old so-and-so was. I haven't got the clue who he was. I've never sponsored him. I don't know him. No. But I guess he thought it was important to say, Yeah, Johnny Harris is my sponsor. Like that's going to give him something. I have people do that all the time with my sponsor. Yeah, Clancy's my sponsor. (laughs) I said, well, why don't you do what Clancy does then? Oh. What do you mean? Answers my question. I just turn and walk away and leave him pondering that. I've got a little cruel speak to me every once in a while. I just bring it out there. Sometimes the devil just gets a hold of me and just kind of hangs in there on me. I usually take it out on the people I sponsor if they're handy. But it's a magic thing, alcoholics and I. There's another thing I want to talk to you about. It's in the book, Alcoholics and I. In our book, Alcoholics and I, was Bill Wilson. Our Bill Wilson, the guy who wrote our book, who shares his experience, strength, and hope with us, talks repeatedly about alcoholics of our type. Alcoholics of our type, he talks about. He wrote the book and the program of recovery for alcoholics of our type. It's been my experience to understand that he wrote about it in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, there's a type of alcoholic, I suppose, who is really nothing more than a heavy drinker. That given any type of reasonable excuse, he can quit drinking and never drink again. The only requirement is you just quit drinking. He's not going to lose his job or his wife or his kids or any of this kind of stuff, so he just quit drinking. He just knocks it off. Then there's another type of alcoholic he walk, talks about who may become physically addicted to alcohol. May even have to be hospitalized. That's where they make treatment centers for. That's where these treatment centers who boast this great success story come out with this kind of stuff. These are the type of people that they rack up the success stories. They can give you names and addresses and phone numbers where these people are. But then Bell talks about the real alcoholic. Talked about the alcoholic of my type who may get sober given any type of reasonable excuse like getting arrested. But sooner or later, left unchecked, I will always drink again. So I must find some type of a spiritual way of life that will afford me some degree of comfort where I never have to pick up a drink of alcohol to get that sense of ease and comfort that tastes would come in a few drinks ever again. 
And based on my experience, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. It's afforded me the opportunity to live comfortable enough for almost 45 years so I haven't had to take a drink of alcohol or use any mind-altering chemicals whatsoever. And to live the good life. And to be able to walk through the tragedy. The mother of my children committed suicide when I was almost six years sober. You know, I don't understand all that kind of stuff. My mother drank herself to death after 30 years of me being in AA. I've been through business failures. I've had divorces. I've had bankruptcy, not bankruptcy, but business failures and financial troubles. My youngest daughter went crazy in her senior year in high school and ran the streets for years and years and years. But all I've ever done, one of those things that hit me, just go to other meetings, just go to more meetings. Call up my sponsor and tell him, I'm going through all these things. Okay, I'll see you at the meeting. How many newcomers are you working with? When's the last time you were on a panel somewhere? When's the last time you went into an institution and tried to carry the message? Why don't you do this? Every single setback that I've had is an amazing thing to me. And you know why there's a God? I know there's a God of my very own. Because in every single one of those setbacks and the depressions that they brought about, I didn't have to swallow anything to ease the pain. I know there's a God. I know because I couldn't do it by myself and I couldn't do it without you. And today, like I told you before, I uh, I live a life beyond my wildest imagination. I just absolutely believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter what my problem may be, if I come here and try to stick out my hand to an alcoholic and do what I'm asked to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, sooner or later, it'll go away. When I was a young man in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was very close well, to Chuck, my papa Chuck. He was probably the only father that I've ever known. He called me pop. He called me son. I called him papa. And I loved him dearly. And one time I was very troubled about something. I don't know what it was, but I know it was real monumental at that moment. And so like I always did, I was going to go home and talk to my papa about that. And I went down to see him, and he was down in Laguna Beach. He was down there on the lawn, bowling on the lawn. And down there, you, they wear white suits, and they throw little balls down the thing and knock little balls around. Kind of a goofy thing, but he got great pleasure out of it. So he finished his game, we sit down, we're having some iced tea, it was a nice day, we're out looking over the ocean. And I laid this big monumental problem on my papa and I said to him, what do you think about that? He looked at me and he said, look out there. And I, what? He said, look out there at the ocean. I said, we're looking at the ocean. You know, I, I want some answers. I don't want this philosophical nonsense from you, I want some answers. I didn't say that, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> And he said, how far can you see? I said, what? He said, how far can you see? I said, I can see the ocean. What do you mean? He said, no, you don't understand, do you? I said, no, I don't. What are you talking about? He said, it's at seven miles to the horizon. I said, really? I broke the old man's been in the sun too long. That's what I think. He's goofy, he's foolish. His iced tea hadn't hit yet. About an hour later, we're sitting up at his house up on a hill, and we got these two big chairs. I'm sitting in one. He said, the other got a big picture window, looks out over the ocean. I thought, well, I'm asking now. He's out of the sun. So I said to him, Papa, I gave him this big deal again, and he laughed at me. And he looked out the window, and he said, how far can you see? And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> so I gave him an answer. I said, seven miles. <laughs> he says, you don't understand, do you? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, from that point to that point is 120 miles. I said, really? He said, you really still don't understand, do you? And I said, no, I don't. He says, the higher you go, the further you see. And the further you see, the more there is to see. And if you could see Alcoholics Anonymous in the 12 steps of our program of recovery in its entirety, it would blind you. It would be like looking into the sun. 
my experience. It's true. That's why they say in our book, we grow along spiritual lines. What I see today, I couldn't have seen yesterday. What I saw the day before yesterday, I couldn't see yesterday. As long as I stay active and close to this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, my book promises me that more will be revealed to me. It promises me that. And I'm here to tell you that the promises in Alcoholics Anonymous are true. But they will only come if you work for them. They only materialize after the ninth step of our program of recovery. Before the ninth step of our program of recovery, there is an awful lot of promises that you don't want to happen into your life, that will happen to you if you don't do these things. One of them says, if you skip this vital step, you may drink. That's a promise. It also says, it's easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels, but we're headed for trouble if we do, because alcohol is a subtle foe. A subtle foe just waits there. All it does is wait for me to be in the wrong place, at the wrong time, in the wrong set of circumstances. It won't matter. Alcohol won't matter to me that I've been sober 40 some odd years. It won't matter to me that I sponsor a host of people. It won't matter to me that I have a sponsor. It won't matter to me that Chuck and Norm are such a great influence in my life as well as Clancy is. It won't matter to me that I have a beautiful wife and a beautiful home and a little dog and two gorgeous daughters and three grandchildren. It won't matter at all. If I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong set of circumstances and I'm just as apt to get squirrely tomorrow as anybody else here and somebody hands me the drink, I'll take it. I have been in that condition sober. I have been so dark and so into myself and so guilt-ridden about my actions being sober that I was in the wrong place in the wrong time somebody handed me a drink you'd have another speaker here tonight. I know that without a doubt. But my safe haven is with you. When I am troubled, I am not home dreaming about my solutions. When I am troubled about anything, when my selfishness and my self-centeredness is dominating my life, when I do not have the ability to drop down on my knees and start saying prayers, when I don't have the prayer to say, God grant me the serenity, this too will pass. When I'm goofy, I'm goofy. And it doesn't make any difference how long I've been sober. But I'd rather be goofy with you than I would goofy by myself. Because by myself, I'm very dangerous. By myself, I think I got it all together. Here, I'm safe harbor. Being with you is a great thing. I hear people say all the time, I had to learn to love me before I could love you. And that's not my experience. I don't even like me sometimes. So how in the world could I possibly ever love me? But I want to tell you one thing. I have never not loved you. I've loved you from the moment I sat in your meetings, even though I didn't know what it was I was feeling for you. Today, with the actions I've taken, surrounded by the people I've been taken with, I realize how much I really, really love Alcoholics Anonymous and you people. And as long as I'm able to stand and move around, I'll be sitting with you. I know it's a, it's a terrible thing, but uh, alcoholism kills many people. It killed my mother. It killed a lot of people. It killed everybody in my family except my daughters and I. But I'm here to tell you, if anything I could possibly do, i like to stand here tonight and thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. But I think even more than that, what I'd really like to do is, I'd like to thank Alcoholics Anonymous for my God. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.